It's time to present Scott Dupont to bring you another episode of Finance Your Movie with tips and strategies to help you get your money to tell your story. It's time! All right, we have a jam-packed show today. Uh, Writer-director Rick Pamplin is back once again. And for the first time, we have producer <laughs> Maggie Pamplin, who, by the way, just got her first PGA mark on her last film, Movie Money Confidential. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. So before we dive in, I'd like to ask both of you about the dynamics of how you both work together, highlighting your strengths in your different filmmaking departments and how you complement each other. As, as the writer director and then Maggie <laughs> as the producer. Well, let me start. I, I, excuse me. I, I used to produce, write, and direct. And it's too much. You know, the producing interfered with my writing and directing. And I, for me, now other people are able to do it. But it was just, it was too much putting my head in the business side of making a movie and not enough in the artistic side. And I was really driven you know, to be a writer first and then be a director, I actually started off my career as an actor. And, you know, I sort of became a director to protect my writing. And then I became a producer to protect my directing because they, they can't fire you if you're a producer. So, um, you know, I went through that process. I did some pictures and it. I really felt I could have been a better writer director if I had, you know, someone else just being the producer. And so when Mag and I got together, she really didn't have any interest in the movie business at all. Her background was in the opera, her background, you know, staging operas and doing all this stuff and being an artist. And um, she had an art studio. And so when we came back from a lengthy honeymoon in the Caribbean, she said, well, I'm just going to come with you. I had offices at Universal Studios. And she said, I'm just going to come to work with you. Well, she came and she never left. And six months <laughs> later, I said, why are we paying rent on a studio that you haven't set foot in in six months? Boy, this hair piece looks really weird, by the way, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it looks like I have a really bad hair piece. Okay. So anyway, we're, we're preparing That's for a real. hurricane. Folks, so 100% real. We're, we're getting ready for the hurricane. So... Um, Anyway, so Maggie um, had all these skills, administrative skills. She had worked in a brokerage firm. She could talk to financial people. She had run a small business of selling her art. So she knew how to interface with um, investors and buyers and all of that. And she had all this production experience in um, the opera. And honestly, hooking up with you, Scott, I think was the greatest thing that ever happened because she got to work with you on this last film, Movie Money Confidential, mm -hmm. and observe you and learn from you because you're a consummate producer. You've made, what, 12, 15 movies, something like that. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I kept telling Maggie, just, you know, ignore me. Just <laughs> learn everything Scott has done. So I think it was very, very beneficial. And I think the best way to learn how to be a producer is to work with somebody who's experienced and sort of by osmosis learn it. So anyway, that was my answer to what should have been your answer, Maggie. What do you have to say? <laughs> okay, yeah, I'm caught up now. Well, really, I think what it is, is it, it's the clear lines. Since we're both artistic, it's kind of fun to work together and bounce ideas off of each other. But in the end, Rick is the director but it's my role to protect his vision, but it really helps because I see what he's trying to do. I see what he wants to get to. And then understanding the producing side and working with the crew and working with the team, I really think that's how we've set up working together. In the beginning, he was very involved in every single step. Whereas now I've kind of learned, you know, from you, Scott, exactly how you get those steps done. So how we work together, kind of our, our pattern is we work all the time. You never know when an editing session is going to break out or when Rick has a new idea on something we want to flush out or some artwork that we're trying to get just right. 
so really our the way that we're working together is just on on all of it but i'm learning the roles of the producer that he doesn't need to know that he doesn't need to be every part of and that's been a a little bit of a that's definitely been a learning curve of what he doesn't have to know and what i can take care of myself but just it's really just been getting the experience to know exactly what to take off his plate because he did used to have everything on his plate so I'm really learning that and going forward, it's going to be a whole lot easier because as I learn all the producing roles and all the, you know, nuts and bolts, it just, it gets a lot easier to protect his creative vision and to focus on that. That's number one. Yeah. And, and like Rick said, allows him to laser focus on making a great picture. So, um, Rick, you've been on the show before and you've talked about how you raised money for your first feature, Provoked. Anyone listening in the audience, go back to season one. I believe it's episode six and seven. It's a great episode to uh, check out. Um, but I'd like to jump in so we don't repeat uh, what you said before on some of your other successful indie fundraisers you did for Michael Winslow Live and Hoover. And then Maggie, I'll ask you for some advice on some recent funding that you did uh, more recently. So Rick, do you have any um, stories or any examples of how you raised money for uh, two of the films where we first crossed paths? And I, I didn't work on these films, by the way, Michael Winslow Live and uh, Hoover, both brilliant films. Well, thanks. What happened with Michael Winslow Live is I relocated due to some family issues from Hollywood to Central Florida. And I met with Disney and I met with Universal and I ended up renting some offices at Universal. And then I said, what movie stars live in town? <laughs> then they said, well, Michael Winslow from Police Academy. And I said, well, I love him. So I got in touch with his manager and he came up and we did an office meeting. And this sound, sounds really silly, but Michael <laughs> wanted to do a toboggan movie in central florida which was kind of crazy and so we kind of kicked some stuff around and michael said you know why don't you come see me perform so he gave me some tickets he was performing in a nightclub and i went to see him and his show was unbelievable and i went backstage and i said michael we need to make a movie of your show and he says why i said because kids don't go to nightclubs <laughs> and kids love you and the noises and the police academy. The, the, you know, you're missing your primary audience. So he had an offer from HBO. And through a long series of negotiations, my ex-partner and I uh, offered them a deal. And our deal was better because they would be partners and it would really showcase Michael where the other one was like an HBO one hour comedy, you know, stand up special. And they said, well, you have 90 days to raise the money, 90 wow. days. Wow, wow. And I didn't know anybody in Orlando, Florida. So I think I went to my mother. I think my mother wrote the first check. And then we went to everybody we knew. And, you know, it was very, very hard. So, but we had this ticking, you know, deadline of Michael was going to go do this HBO special. And we could get Michael and we could do it at Universal Studios. And we could do a better movie. And we thought it would, you know. So I went to a lot of acting classes. And I met actors. I met different people in Orlando. Every night I went out and network. And there was this one actor who was a retired police officer. And he helped raise the bulk of the money. And we had people that would come in and go, oh, we'll give you the whole budget. And, you know, the time wasters, you know. Yeah, and I've heard that before. Would, They'd come to Universal Studios and they'd waste our time. And, you know, and, and so we had a budget and we got very close to the end and we realized we weren't going to make it. So I said to my partner, let's cut the budget by a third. He said, what do you, you can't do that. I said, we don't, we're not going to get the movie made. So we cut a third of the budget and the very last investors, the deadline was December 31st. Wow. So we were in our offices on New Year's Eve, raising money. We got the money. We actually were able to locate on New Year's Eve, Michael Winslow's manager. And we said, we've got the money, I promise you. He says, do you have it in hand? We said, no, it's being wired, but we have the contracts, we have the money, we're ready to go. 
And we didn't know that the Federal Reserve closes on New Year's Day. So we couldn't have the money for a couple, three days. So it was, it was very nerve wracking. But I remember at about 1130, we went out on Universal Studios back lot and got like a beer and a hamburger and celebrated. We had <laughs> raised the money. So we made the movie. It was on schedule, on time, you know, uh, under budget. And we made very little money, but we made the movie. And we shot it in 35 millimeter. It was terrific. Uh, eventually, we sold it to Stars, which was unbelievable. Um, I think the first check we got was like half the budget or something. It was un it was just great. And then, so we wanted to make another movie. So I wanted to make a one man show about. Uh, I had a couple people in mind, and uh, Ansel Adams was one of them who I had met, and I was very interested in his nature photography during the Great Depression. He was sort of the, the father of the modern day, you know, environmental movement. And I thought a one man show with a great actor playing Ansel Adams. Well, there were a lot of problems with the rights and the, all of that stuff. And then I wanted to do Robert Kennedy as a one man show. And it came back to me through some sources that the Kennedy family didn't want me to do that. I wanted to do a, a one man show of Robert Kennedy. So somebody said to me, Hoover, J. Edgar Hoover. And I was like, eh, I don't, you know, so then I started thinking, well, wait a minute. I have access to Ernie Borgnine. I can get to Ernest Borgnine. He'd be great, you know, to play J. Edgar Hoover. So we started pitching it. So I called his publicist and he said, well, you can't pitch it over the phone. You better come to Hollywood. So I went out to Hollywood and uh, Ernie was doing a, an NBC show called The Single Guy. And I'm a big guy. And Ernie picked me up out of the bleachers and lifted me down onto the set. They had like three sets. <laughs> I know, I know the set you're talking about. And, and he says to me, tell me about what he, this little movie. So I pitched it on the set of the single guy whispering. And Ernie said, I'll do it. Wow. He said, nobody respects me. I want to get back in movies. I do all these little TV shows. I don't like what I'm being offered. He said, I like this. This is original. And he, and he said, how many of the lines are mine? And I said, all of them. It's a one-man show. You're going to be J. Edgar Hoover, come back from life. And he loved it. And he said, I'll do it. And he did it at a very reasonable price. So now for the second film, and this is for all your viewers and listeners, we had an A-list movie star. Ernest Borgnine had made over 200 films, and he'd won an Academy Award for Best Actor for Marty. So we went back to all of our investors. And we called them up and about half of them said, we're in. Great idea. Yeah, and an Academy right. Award winner. Right. Well, but when you have a star attached, it goes much quicker. So uh, we were raising the money. We got the money. And um, we, Borg9 said to me, when you get the script done, send me the script. In a couple of days, I'll call you. I'm, Great. So Borg9... We send him the script to Beverly Hills to where he lives. And I don't hear for a week. So I call up his publicist. I go, what's going on? Oh, you know, he's going to read it. He's going to, I said, but I got all the money. I got all these investors. We need to book a sound that we need to shoot the movie. This went on for six weeks. I had investors calling me up. You know, they're going to sue me. They're going to call the police. I've stolen their money. You know, if Borgnine's not going to do it, just tell us. So it, it had like all the time when you're trying to get talent, like on this film, Movie Money Confidential, as you know, Scott, you were able to get Burt Reynolds on the last day of a five week shoot. Yeah, it's so just crazy. Sometimes these stars come in at the last minute. So one day I got a call and somebody said, oh, Ernest Borgnine's on the phone for you. And I thought it was a prank. And he called up and he said, do you have cameras down there? And I said, who is this? He said, Ernie Borgnine. And I hung up. I thought it was some, you know, intern or somebody in the building, you know, the producer's building. So he called back and he says, you better not hang up on me again. This is Ernest Borgnine. I'm like, oh, okay. And he said, have you got cameras? Yeah. So he just showed up? No, he called me on the phone. Oh. And he, oh. Goes, and he goes, November the 2nd. So I'm looking at my counter. I said, well, Ernie, that's not enough pre-production. If you want to make this picture... I will be in Orlando on November 2nd. 
but if you don't want me on November 2nd, I'm not making your picture. So now I've got a very short schedule and I've got to figure all this stuff out. So I said, okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. I hang up the phone. You know, I tell my lawyer, I tell my partner, everybody's excited. We go downstairs to Universal Search. We need a sound stage on November 2nd. Well, when you really get Ernest Borgnine, come back. No, no, no. We, I just talked to him. He's coming yeah. here. Ernest Borgnine is coming, you know. So, you know, we had to go through that whole process. So we start, we start buying insurance. We start hiring crew because we have no time. It's like good or so the lawyer comes in the next day and he goes, stop everything, stop. I'm like, what, what do you mean stop? He says, do you have a signed contract with Borgnine? I said, no. He said, you can't, you're spending the investor's money. There's no contract with Borgnine. You got to get him to sign a contract. So we'll, we'll, we'll call right now. So we called his office in Beverly Hills and Joyce was the secretary. Joyce said, oh, he just got in his RV. He just drove out the painted desert to memorize the script. He has no phone service. Oh I said, God. I got to get him to sign a contract. I can't get insurance. I can't get bonding. I can't do anything. So, and I said, I'll never be able to make the picture. She said, well, he's coming. He's going to make the picture. You better, you know. So I said, all right. She said, he calls in once a day. I said, she says, well, I haven't called. He said, no, no, I haven't called my lawyer. You know, we need to get a signature. So the day goes on about 4.30 in the afternoon. He calls my lawyer. And in those days, we had the fax machine with the thermal paper that would curl up. And uh, Ernie says, this is Ernest Borgnine. What do you need? And the lawyer says, well, we need a signed contract. Well, is it the terms that I talked over, you know, with Rick Pamphlin? Yes, exactly those terms. And he said, uh, all right. He said, uh, can, you, can you fax it to me? I'll sign it right now and send it back. And he said, buddy, what's your fax number? And he gives it to him. And they're like, here it comes. You know, we send it out. We're sitting there waiting. We're sitting there waiting. And it's like, bing, bing, bing. And then it comes back. And at the top, it says Bob's Union 76. <laughs> he was at a gas station in the painting. You got it. Desert, you got and he it. signed the contract at the gas station. It was unbelievable. So then we had a movie. You know? There you go. And, and, yeah. and this fun and the stress of being a producer at the same time. So for our audience, I want to go back just to go over a few of the beats how you and and it was smart i don't know the exact budget because i wasn't involved but it was smart i'm guessing well under a million dollars because you had limited number of days you had a small cast it was mainly your academy award winner but how did you actually raise the money did you bring another fundraiser in or were you doing meetings face to face at the citrus club did you have meetings at your office did you just go through the phone book we didn't go for the phone book, but all the other ones. Basically, I'll just tell you exactly what the steps were. My lawyer introduced me to Louise Levison, and he said, you got to get a business plan. And I didn't want anything to do with it. I said, I, what are you talking about? I made movies in LA. I'd never heard of this. He said, no, 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 you need, a, you need a business plan because you need to show projections. You need to bring in an outside person and you, this will you know, show investors and she can you know, put all this together. And so I reluctantly hired her on both of these pictures. And she wrote these brilliant business plans, explaining the movie business, explaining the market, how to get the money back, why this movie had a chance, and what the projection for low, medium, and high was. And this is before Blair Witch. So this, we were still sort of in uncharted waters. But, and then with her business plan, we put a sizzle package together. You know, my credits in Hollywood, my crews. We went IATSE, DGA, and SAG, you know, in those first two pictures. Then we had Ernest Borgnine, was unbelievable. We stacked up all of his, in those days, VHS box of his of his movies, and you've heard of every one of them. You know, I mean, they're just like the greatest yeah, movies yeah. ever. And and so everybody knew Ernest Borgnine. So we did the first third was a sizzle package. Then we did a treatment. Never show an investor a script. We did a treatment. Then we did the budget. And then in the back, we had all the legal disclaimers, the contract, the subscription agreement. And we put these in a binder. Okay. And we were very careful who we gave that prospectus to. So like if you came up to our office and it was very clear you weren't the right person, you know, we weren't that interested. We were very willing to say no to money. You know, some people wanted goofy stuff. 
some people want drugs, some people want women, some people want weird things to give you money in exchange for your movie. And we always say no. And my lawyer then had been a um, prosecuting attorney in Florida. So he was very sensitive to being able to make sure that the investors, we, we knew where the money was coming from. Because we got a lot of people that tried to give us, you know, dirty money. And it happens all the time. And my advice is get away as quick as humanly possible. Happened to me in LA, happened to me in Orlando. So basically I would have a meeting, I would pitch the project, and if they were interested, they would then ask questions and the lawyer would answer them. And you know, if they were gonna sign an agreement, they would go in his office or they could sleep on it. You know, we weren't like a timeshare thing. You didn't have to write a check that day. And I said to people, if you go home and you sleep on it and this is not right for you, don't invest. Yeah, because yeah it's, you gotta it, do that. The, and the first thing we told people was a high risk. You're, it's a total risk. If you can't afford to risk the money, don't invest it. Because the movie business is unpredictable. We think we know what we're doing. We've got projections. We've got great elements. The, the movies are very reasonably budgeted, but who knows what's going to happen? So we tried to cast our investors very carefully, and that helped a lot. But those first two projects, we raised all the money in less than 90 days. Wow. So we thought, well, for bo for both of them. Yeah. We thought, well, this is easy. Think up wow. a movie, call some investors, and you know they'll give you money. But you, you but went through also, a lot of people, right? I mean, isn't it a numbers game? No. Actually, the less. We had a closing rate. Maggie was around when we were raising money. And I think our closing rate was 80-some percent. Of everybody that we met, we closed about 80%. Wow. We were very strong. So you, so you pre-screened the people. You, you were careful well, who first, you brought up to your office. Right. First thing you'd say if you come in my office, Scott, I would say, how interested are you, Scott, in investing in a movie on a one to 10 scale? And then I'd say, how much are you interested in investing? And then I would say, how much risk do you want to take? Because some people would say, well, I don't want to take any risk. And I'd say, yeah, well, thank yeah. you for coming up. If this is not the right thing for you. Yeah, so you some wouldn't go before. Say, I have no interest in the movie business, or I just like to meet movie stars, or I wanted to come see Universal Studio. And Literally, my lawyer would throw them out of the meeting and say, thank you, goodbye. We don't have time. So we were very polite, but very picky. And I must also say this, there are certain times in the movie business that certain areas or trends are taking place. At that time, Orlando was booming. You had Disney, you had Universal, you had Spielberg shooting at Universal Studios, you had TV shows, you had Nickelodeon filming. And at that time, Florida was the third biggest production center in the country, and they were calling themselves Hollywood East. Yeah, it was so huge. So there was an enormous energy that investors thought, I wanna get on this. And, and it was very impressive to come to my office at Universal Studios and see all this stuff and look out the window and like, oh my God, there's sound stages and there's, you know, they're making movies here. They're making TV shows. So, um, you know, it was a great time. In my opinion, that time has passed and it's harder. And in the post-pandemic world that we're in right now, it's extremely hard to raise money. And there are times like in different administrations, and I, I'm not being political, I'm just observing and giving back. When Bill Clinton was president, it was very easy to raise movie money because there was this whole dot-com explosion and things were going great. When Obama came in and there was a recession and the economy was struggling, it was very hard to raise money. So a lot of the factors are depending on what's going on in inflation, recessions, the economy, real estate. Most of the people that invest in independent film are people who are in the stock market, are people who are in real estate, and, and usually a few other things so they like to spread it around and have a diversified portfolio. But if the country is not doing well financially, it's pretty hard to raise money for independent films. Yeah. Maggie, uh, you've had a lot of experience on that. Would you agree? 
So we, we're running into a quick, I got to take a uh, break here, guys. If you can come All back. Right. And uh, Maggie, thanks for hanging in there. When we come right back, uh, we're going to hear from Maggie Pamplin of Pamplin Film Company.